Today, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think there's any loose ends with what we had before. So today we are going to get into, well, sometimes it's called data manipulation language, but I prefer just to call it another aspect of SQL. And that is being able to change values in the database. All right. We've gone over queries, and to be sure, we might go back over some more advanced queries as the term progresses. Um, but we re I really want to hit the updating and uh, uh, inserting, updating, and deleting. And there's, there's a different statement, obviously, for that. A few things to keep in mind with that. First of all, let's talk about Let's talk about all of the statements, and then we'll drill down and, and talk about one in more detail, and then show how it's done in ASP.NET. What is a statement to insert into a table? Insert. The insert statement. I realized a second after I said that that I kind of gave the answer away. All right? I probably should have said, what's the statement to add a row to the table, and see if anyone would have bit and said the add statement. Right. <laughs> what's the insert statement look like? The insert statement looks like this. And, well, let me rephrase that. There's actually a couple versions of an insert statement. I'm going to focus on the version that we're typically going to use. I may mention the other ones, but I'm going to focus on the ones that, that, that we're typically going to use in this context. Insert into student, let's say. Student first name, student last name, um, email, and then so on. Values, Mike Zellers, M Zellers, at Lorraine, ccc.edu. Let's pretend that these are the only fields involved. Now, a couple things that you may notice about this in looking at it. Chances are the table has a student ID column, right? Chances are the primary key to this table that is not shown up here, but chances are this table contains a student ID along with the student first name, student last name, and email. Why don't, why did I not have the student first name in my list? You can have students with multiple same first names. I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. Why did I not have the student ID? I said student first name, uh, I meant student auto -generated. ID. It's auto-generated, right. Assuming that it's an auto number key, we don't need to insert that. The database will automatically <laughs> generate the next number available. I know, leaving gaps in the number, If for those of you that are overly concerned about that. Yeah, we'll never get them back. Once they're gone, they're gone. Exactly. But you don't have to include an auto number because the database is going to, to do that. All right. Let's look at this in more detail. Insert, always the same. Into, always the same. Student is the name of the table. Enclosed in <coughs> parentheses are the list of the columns that we're inserting. Now, does that have to be every column in the table? No. It would not have to be every column in the table. There could be some other columns down here. Maybe, you know, major, advisor. And maybe you don't know these. Maybe you don't know these right off the, the start when a student registers or, or signs up. Yes? Would you run into a problem if you had one of those columns was like required? Usually? Exactly. And we're going to get to that in a second. So if it's required, then absolutely you would need to include it. All right? Like if email address was required and I left it off, then the insert would fail. All right? After the word values, then, so 
So the, the columns in, in close in parentheses, the word values, in close in parentheses is a list of values. Now, if they're string values, they're going to be put in quotes. If it's numeric values, there are not going to be any quotes. So if I had like a age, let's say, let's see, how old am I this year? 31. Me too. Yeah. Boy, I didn't get the uproarious laughter that I expected with that. I was thinking of some clever to say. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to say the time has been. Okay, yeah, right, exactly. Exactly, I should do the opposite. The age is 81. It's like, man, you're looking good. Yeah, you're looking good for your age. Yeah, you're, looking good for your age. Yeah, you're pretty spry. Um, so if there was a, a numeric field, there wouldn't be quotes around it. And if there were dates, I forget the, I think there's pound signs around it or something. I don't know. I don't remember off the top of my head. The nice thing is, is you don't have to remember that. Because we're going to be using the SQL parameter object, and that deals with that for you. The SQL parameter object also does things like, um, what would be a good word for it, like data scrubbing. For example, these I think actually are single quotes, not double quotes. But, let's say my name was O. Zellers. We found out that my family went to Ireland or something. <laughs> All right? And never told anyone, and we just discovered it. Do you see the problem with this? Mm -hmm. SQL is going to think <coughs> that that is my entire last name. Look at this and not know what to do with it, thinking it's another value or whatever, and it's going to blow up. All right? In reality, um, that's called a SQL injection. That, that can be used in what's called a SQL injection attack, where people manipulate by entering bad data in the forms or the query strings with things like that to go and do some manipulation of databases. So. The good news is, is um, I think sometimes I've heard it called sanitizing your input. In other words, making sure that there isn't any issues with this sort of thing. All right. Bottom line is we're going to be using a SQL parameter object, and it will handle these sorts of things for us. So we don't really have to worry about those. All right. What can go wrong with an insert statement? We've already heard one thing. That, that you can omit a column that's required. Like if email is required and I had nothing for email, boom, it's going to blow up. What's another thing that could go wrong? You could change data that you really don't want to. That is more of a, that's a different kind of problem than I'm describing. Yeah, that's a problem. Um, what, what I'm talking about are what are things that would make an insert statement blow up. You could try to insert something that's not there. Like, let's see, I mean, like, I don't know. Nothing that you insert is going to be okay. there. That's why you're inserting. No, 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 like, like, trying to insert, I guess, like, bad data. Like, I mean, if you okay, bad data. Yeah, I guess it's pretty important. Like, if you even have a, don't have a row for it and you're trying to insert something that you think is there and it's not there, like a, a column that's not there. Okay, I could have general syntax errors, yeah, so all right? Yeah. Those are pretty easy to catch. Those will blow up instantly. Now, what you're alluding to, and I'm not sure if this is what you're thinking of or it's not, but what if I have in this table an advisor ID? It's a foreign key. You'll never know what your advisor ID is, probably. Well, there's that issue, but... The issue I'm thinking of is what if I try to insert an advisor ID that doesn't exist in the database? All right. Um, yeah, that's bad data, but, you know, come on, we need to be more specific. Because bad data can be bad data a number of different ways, right? 
bad data could be missing data. Bad data could be wrong data type. Bad data. Pardon me? Duplications. We'll get to that one in a second. Um, in this, this is, a, this is a data integrity violation. In other words, we set up and we defined a foreign key for advisor ID. All right. That means that we can't insert something if it doesn't have a valid advisor ID. All right, the other thing I heard that wouldn't be a problem in this particular case, but it could be, depending on how your table is structured, is if you inserted duplicate data. In other words, if you had, um, if you did not use an auto number and you came up with the faculty ID some other way and you try to uh, uh, insert in a second faculty number 1000, all right, that would cause it to blow up. Now, here's the interesting thing, all right? Some of kind of the biggest, most egregious sorts of errors are going to blow up no matter what we do. So, testing, we're going to shake those out pretty quickly. So, for example, if the column name was email, and I called the column name email address, here, that's going to be obvious the first time I insert it, right? Because there's no such column as email address if the column is named email. So those are actually the good kinds of errors because they're obvious. They're going to blow up. And as long as you've tried to insert one row into this table, you're going to see that there's a problem with that. The more insidious errors are the errors that are situational, like this. Syntactically, this statement is correct. All right? So it's not going to just blow up instantly. It's going to blow up at runtime when the database realizes that there's no advisor 99999. Now, what can we do to prevent that sort of error from happening? Pardon me? We could validate it beforehand. What's another thing that we can do? Think about how we're going to enter the advisor ID for this student, the form. Create a drop-down. Create a drop-down and only let them select valid stuff. Mm -hmm. All right? But that so, can get cumbersome if they have a ton of advisor IDs. Yep. Advisors, you know. Well, the bottom line is, is you could take some steps in your user interface to make sure that. You know, maybe there's another way to handle it other than a drop-down. Right. All right? But a drop-down would be one way to do it. And yeah, that could be cumbersome in some case, and you could design maybe a cleverer way. A search box. Right, for exactly. But the bottom line is through your user interface design, you could address this so that they could only select a valid advisor ID. Right. All right? Updates are going to be similar to this. All right? That's the one I said was, that's what I meant for the danger of updating was changing data that you really don't want to. Right. That's what I was thinking of for insert, but it's just update. Those. Right. Update. And I'll put an update statement here. with an update? Well, some of the same things with a insert could go wrong with an update. If I had bad data for this, um, some of those obvious ones. If I was also changing the advisor ID, if 
I changed it to something that didn't exist in the database? That's the same problem as if I, um, if I um, try to insert it and it didn't exist. Now to Jesse's point before about updating wrong data, what if I omit the WHERE clause? What happens if I omit the WHERE clause on an update statement? It updates everyone. It updates all the rows. So it's very similar to a SELECT statement. All right? A SELECT statement, if I don't specify with the WHERE clause what students I want to see in the list, who am I going to see? I'm going to see all the students. In an update statement, if I go to update and I don't specify a WHERE clause, who will it go and update? It'll update everyone. All right? So the WHERE is the filter, but with that. Now, typically, if you notice, notice I didn't say, like, use the name in the WHERE clause. It's always best to change uh, or, or to include in the WHERE clause the ID, the primary key. That way, if I was changing, let's say, an email address or something, if there happened to be two Mike Zellers on campus, just because I change my advisor doesn't mean the other Mike Zellers change their advisor. Right? So I would use the primary key, because the primary key is the guarantee that you're only updating one row, that you're updating a unique member of that. Now, the delete statement is the, is the easiest of them all. The easiest of them all to mess up. <laughs> well, yeah, right, right. Yeah, I was going to say, that's not a good thing, by the way. Delete star from star. Exactly. Where star equals star. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Peace out. And, and I quit. <laughs> I'm sure somebody's done that. Somebody, Dude, somebody has worked there Highland, somewhere. <laughs> my buddy works at Highland Software, and one of their QA guys had quit because he was getting so pissed off at management. And he literally, right before he quit, he went to one of their main, luckily they had a backup. Yeah, I was he just going to say that. He right. went to their, their main server and went, where, or delete star from star where star. And it deleted the entire server. Yeah. But luckily they had a backup. It took, it took almost two weeks to restore the server back to where it was. Right. That's why you don't piss off IT guys. Delete from student where, and then you have a where clause. Again, if you don't have a where clause, it will try to delete everything. Notice I said try. What would keep it from deleting everything? Uh, a pop-up that says, are you sure? Well, no, <laughs> not software-wise, but from a database perspective. What database limitation would keep this from deleting everything? Because you have, like, like, key relationships? Though? If there were relationships. In other words, if there was a... Uh, a, a table that was related to the student table, like maybe a student class table or something like that, and you went and tried to delete a student, one, two, three, four, a delete statement will never orphan another table, right? It will never get rid of one, two, three, four if one, two, three, four has children, has related rows in other tables, all right? So I could not delete, for example, in our database for the for the assignments, I could not delete a um, department if there were faculty associated with it, or if there were courses associated with it. All right, it would prohibit the deletion. So in this instance, would you want to do delete from star where student ID equals one two three four because then it will look over everything for that student ID and delete it? No, no. You, you de you're always deleting the entire row. So delete star or simply delete from student is doing the same thing. Oh, okay. All right? The database will let you know if you have a issue with that. All right? You can handle it a few different ways. A lot of times what you'll do is you'll let it try to delete it, and if it gets an error, you'll just make sure you handle the error gracefully as opposed to simply blowing up. All right, we'll look at examples of this and we'll look at doing error checking. The last thing that I'll say for now, and we'll come back to this and we'll, we'll consider other scenarios and so on. 
Actually, when I said the delete, there's two ways that you can define a foreign key. The cascade delete, that's when you delete the parent, it takes out all the children as well, um, versus restrict deletion, whereas you, if you try to delete something, if it has children, it won't allow you to delete it. Um, the point I'm trying to raise is, is that when you start getting into database interactivity, the, pot the potential for errors kind of goes up pretty quickly. And the potential for the worst kind of errors, right? Compile errors are good kind of errors, right? Because you know something's wrong. You can't compile it. You can't run the code, right? You know you messed up. You got to fix it. You can't even pretend that it's working, right? These are runtime errors, though. In other words, syntactically, my statements might be correct. But I get an error because I'm trying to put in a student that has no email address, and that's a required field. Or I'm trying to update a student and change their advisor ID, but their advisor ID doesn't exist. Or I try to delete from the student table, and there's related rows in some other table. So this requires more testing, and it also requires more extensive error catching. And we'll look at some of the techniques that you can do for these things. That'll be a big part of what we're, what we're, what we're going to do with this. Because we can spend a couple minutes talking about how to update it. And we can change the thing that I did last time to update like that. But is it going to be good? Well, no, not really. There's going to be potential for a lot of issues with that. All right. We're, what we're going to do, though, is we're going to start by gradually incorporating in inserts, updates, and deletes into the example that we had before. All right? Let me go and pull up that example. And we're going to start off with updates. Why are we starting off with updates? Well, it seems to go well with what we had before. If, if you remember what we had before, if the user logs on, they can see their information, right? So if they need to change it. So if they need to change it, they can change it. And they can only change theirs. I can't go in and change anyone else's. All right, so let's go and pull that up. our memory about this for a second and then we'll change it to update. a review, you're expected to have this code memorized. So when I'm talking about stuff. Okay, so here I go run an update statement. Can you can see it down here. <laughs> Thank you. I did indeed forget that the projector was around. I just saved you students' life that are watching this on video. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, let's go and run this guy. You know, Jesse's going to start getting comments on YouTube and all that. Be like, uh, Jesse, sidekick. Better than Eddie Richter. <laughs> <laughs> Just <he's> like. <laughs> <laughs> 
you're, you're, you're like teacher's assistant, man. I, I, I ought to, I ought to have, I ought to have like, uh, like, like a sidekick that like sits up there and makes comments, and like a band, you know, like a, like a Paul Schaefer kind of thing. Or, all right, here we had this, and we had where we log on, and. If we've logged on successfully, we get to a page with our information on it. And again, if we have not logged on successfully, um, you know, we're, we're, de we're denied access to this page. Excuse me. And we redirect back to the login page. And we can only see our information and, and so on. So, what do we have with this? We have our login page, which programmatically creates a SQL statement. That's what we're seeing here. And doing this, does it add any type of like behind the scenes security when you create logins like that? You know what I mean? What 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 do you <coughs> just like detect for detecting fraud and things like that? I guess there really is no way of doing that. That's why they put those special characters boxes to match the numbers and letters to. I just didn't know if there's any type of built-in behind-the-scenes security that goes into creating. Not those. not really no. no. Against hackers. You know you you could certainly within your code if I was doing this keep track of. IP addresses, see how many unsuccessful logon, you know, do that sort of thing um, if you wanted to. All right, here again, we're creating those things programmatically. We define our SQL statement with the parameters getting filled in at runtime from the user ID and text box for the password. We then access it, look for it. If they have logged in correctly, we set the session ID and redirect them to the player info. Otherwise, we display an error message. All right, what we're gonna work on today is this update page. Now you can almost imagine that we're going to have to change two things on this page. What do you suppose the two things that we need to change on this page are? Like, as it is right now, or as yeah. the user wants to change? Well, a as it is right now. The uh, bare minimum to get this working. We would want to change user ID and password. No, I mean, what, what components, what, what pieces of code it's do we need to change? Only. Yeah. All right, it's read-only right now. So what do we need to change to make it be editable? We need to change the SQL statement. And where does the SQL statement live? Uh, in the data source. In the data source. What else do we have to change? Uh, you have to make the, the fields, like, editable. Right. And where do those fields live? The, 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 not the, grid view, the, the detail view. The detail view. All right. The point I'm trying to make is, as with all the database, with, with the database interactivity that we've looked at for the most part, there's always a two pieces of it. There's this data source part of it, and that controls the database interactivity, and then there is the um, user interface part of it that controls the way that the user interacts with the data. And in this case, they're both set to read only. All right. Notice if I click on this details view, I don't have the ability to allow updates yet. All right. I'm going to change the data source, and we'll see that we're going to get some different options here in a minute. So I'm going to go in, and I'm going to configure my data source. And... I'm going to go into update. Right now, we'll just go into update. Let me let me.
me pull up the database table so I know what the tables and column names are. All right, we have a player table. And these are the names of the columns. Player, F name, L name, email, user ID, user password. Someone remember that. All right, I'm going to say update. What comes next after the word update? What do you want to update? What do you mean by what I want to update? Player, player's name. Yeah, the, the name of the table. Right. Updates, inserts, and deletes only work on one table. Now, they may have an impact across several tables, but you only insert into one table. You only update one table. You only delete from one table. Now, with cascading deletes, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, you, can, you can take out multiple rows in multiple tables, but for this, we're just going to deal right now with one table. Everybody stop. Set. And here's where we go in and we put the things that we're going to change. All right. So I'm going to set F name equal to what? Question mark. Question mark. We don't know what. Runtime, somehow we're going to get that guy a value. All right. Somehow through our details view, there's going to be a, a value for it. But right now, we don't know. We're not going to set everyone's first name to Mark. All right? We're going to set their name based on what was entered there. So I can then say L name equals question mark. Password. Email equals question mark. User ID equals question mark. User password equals question mark. Do I need to add anything else? Would you want to get into the user, user ID? That being an auto number? User ID is not an auto number. User ID, is like the user ID yeah, user ID is is um, like the, the 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 person's login name. I, I still probably fundamentally wouldn't want to allow somebody to change my user ID. Well, we can we can look at addressing that. If they use their email address, and they get a new email address, and they no longer use the old email address, then you would want to change your user ID at that point. We, th that's a design issue, right? That, that is, you know, uh, th there's always a design aspect of is it a good idea to do it versus a technical aspect of how you do it. Yeah, you can do it. Do I need anything else on this? I will answer it for my own, I'll answer my own question. Yes, we do. What do we need? The where? We need the where clause, right? Because we don't want to change every single person in the, in the player table when I change one. So where... Player ID equals what? Question mark. I'm going to go copy this in a notepad so we can take a closer look uh, at it.
Notice as we look at this, the word update, the table that we're updating, the word set appears once. All right. We then have a list of column value pairs. F name equals question mark, comma, L name equals question mark, comma, and so on. No comma after the last one. Makes sense. Then finally I have where player ID equals question mark. The question marks again represent the fact that this stuff is going to get filled in at runtime from somewhere. Alright? Okay. So now this is oops. I opened one too many. Now we've made the update statement. We've set the data source so it understands how to update. Alright? This is a command that we're going to run when we go and update this. Is this going to force them to make all of them, though? To change everything? Or well, we'll, we'll see. Okay. We'll see. That's, that's a good question. The update statement is going to change everything. Yeah, so if they don't put anything, it's going to blank it out. Well, not necessarily. Not if the form gets populated with what's already there. True. So, in other words, I pull up my information, it shows my current information. Yeah. I go and change my email address, but don't change my first name, last name. Well, then it's going to update it with what's in the form. Well, my original name is going to be there. So it will, strictly speaking, do an update, but it really won't change that and won't blank it out. All right, I can click Next, Next. Notice that I didn't have to specify. I had to specify for my retrieve, for my select, where the parameters come from. But I don't have to specify for the update, which is kind of interesting. Because it already knows where it's coming from, right, is the bottom line. You're just adding a feature to what's mm -hmm. already there. Exactly. <laughs> now, so I've updated my SQL data source to allow for updates. But I still can't update because I need to tell my detail view is OK to update. Now, you might say to yourself, why doesn't that do that automatically? Well, it provides for more flexibility. For example, I might have a page that everyone can see, but only user or only administrative users can change. You know, for example, um, like league information. Maybe everyone can see that such and such league is a softball league for 10 and 11 year old kids, but and it's named the Pony League. Whereas only the administrator can go and change that to correct the spelling of Pony League or whatever. All right? And therefore, you have the flexibility of changing one without changing the other. And I can programmatically then look to see if the person's an administrator. And if they are, then give them the right to change the fields. But the, for that, for the administrator, how, where would that be set? Would that be set in the database or on the dot? Well, that would be set probably the way it would be done is when we logged in, there would probably be an administrator flag. Oh, okay. And we would set a session variable for that administrator flag. And then based on the value of that session variable, we could enable and disable certain things. All right. So I'm going to click this. And now notice that I have another option, edit, enable editing. And this is what's going to make me allow to go in and edit the data in this table. All right. I've defined a SQL statement, but the details view is still going to display everything in labels. If, however, I click Enable Editing, this is what I get. There's an Edit button here. Because I was just going to ask, would you want to put all this on a separate page for editing? But that's pretty nice. All right. So I go and run this, and I log on. I log in.
database. I didn't close my database. Good call. I was I was getting worried. She's really bad at that. Somebody's got issues. I've worked on computers a long time. That's all. All right. I go and log in. Take two. Now I have my grid view, and I can click edit. Notice what happens when I click the edit. I'll click cancel to go back. Right now, these things are all in labels. I click edit. I can go in, and I have a text box. So I can go type in Michael Zellers, click update, and boom, I'm changed to Michael Zellers. All right? Now... Here's something that you might ask, because this would bother me, all right? This would bother me. If I log on and I go to this page, I have to click edit before I can edit this, right? I don't kind of don't like that. If I'm viewing my personal information, I want to just be able to edit it in one step. I don't want to have to um, click something first. Okay, and that's that's a fair statement. If that's the functionality that you want, that's great. Um, I would say that's introducing a an extra step, and sure. there is a cancel button there. So if I did enter something, then I decided, oh wait a minute, um, I accidentally changed that. Um, I could hit cancel. But again, we want to know technically how to do these things, and you can make the design decisions for your own projects. If we look at this detail view, there is somewhere here the default mode. And the default mode of this was read only. All right? So, I could change the default mode of this to edit. And then I don't have to do that extra step. So I log on. Now I'm automatically in edit mode. And I can go and change that and so on. Notice I can't change player ID, right? That wasn't included in the update statement, so that's not an editable field. So I can go and click then update, and it updates it. All right. What do you suppose will happen if I changed, try to change his username to MLZ? It won't allow it because you didn't allow duplicates. I think it'll throw an exception. All right. Well, let's let's find out. I think both of you are right. I, if I remember right, when I created this database, I specified that user ID user ID was uh, had a unique index on it. All right. I think it was just going to error out though because we didn't put any type of. Uh, Handling exactly. Here. Right now we have not done anything to handle errors. All right. So now it's just going to pop up and go back to your, yeah. Wow. The change you requested to the table is not successful because they create duplicate values in the index, primary key, and relationship. Blah, 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 blah. All right. So, forgetting the argument that they should not be able to change their user ID, which is a, probably a valid argument. All right, but forgetting that for, for a minute here, how are we going to handle this? Conditional statement. A conditional statement where? In the back code line. You'll just put if new ID or whatever equals something ID in the database, then don't you know, send an error message saying, hey, you cannot do that. 
Okay, you're, taken. you're you're pretty close. You're pretty right on with that. Does anyone want to add to his answer? I obviously can't do something like give a drop down, right? That doesn't really make sense. You can just create, if they hit update for that, you can create a search. And if it's not taken, then allow the update. If it's taken, then say you add a one to the end of it. I could. I could go in and when I click update, I could run out and see is there a user with that ID and if there is, I could back out of the update and say, hey, look, you can't change that, pick something else. And like you said, maybe even suggest something. Yeah. You could do it in the control, in the um, detail view. Just say this column is not is read only. Right. I, I could make a read only so they couldn't change it. But the assumption was is that we want to change it. Now, we're going to have other issues like this. For example, if we throw in a team ID here. What happens if there's an invalid team ID or something like that? All right, so we're going to have this issue before. I assume there's multiple ways to do this. There's, there are multiple ways to do that, and one way to handle it, generally your choices are this in very general terms, and you sort of have to decide what is worth the effort and what isn't worth the effort. The easy way out is not always the best way, but it's not always the worst way either, <laughs> all right? In this case, there's nothing I can do to the form that would prevent them from entering in a duplicate user ID, right? Because it's a text box. I can't like make a drop down of all the available user IDs. That doesn't even make sense. So it'd be infinite. All right, it'd be infinite, right. I could, when they click update, I could run out and see if there's a problem. And if there is a problem, I could not do the update. I could back out of the update. Or I could try the update, let it fail, and just be in a position to clean up the mess. I mean, what is the real problem here? The real problem is, is that the user is going to get this error and have no idea what they did wrong. All right? No idea what they did wrong. Because unless you're a software developer and unless you know how this code works, that probably makes no sense to you. In fact, it's actually going to be worse than that for a user. Because there's security in ASP.NET such that typically the user won't even get this descriptive of an error message. We're getting this descriptive of an error message because we're in development mode, right? And we want to see the details of why something didn't work. You probably, for security reasons, don't want to divulge this kind of stuff to your users if it fails. You just want to say, nah, it didn't work. It blew up. All right, so if we didn't do anything, they wouldn't even get this descriptive of an error. So, the third way that we can design our form to, to keep errors from happening, we can write code to keep errors from happening. The third approach is sort of like, <coughs> give it a shot. If it doesn't work, be there to clean up the mess. All right, in a nutshell. All right, well, how do we do that? Well, we can do that a number of different ways, and that brings up the concept of an exception. All right. Not really. The one time this semester that strategy won't work. Let's look at the events that are associated with the details view. Let's go in our code behind. Let's look at our details view. I didn't want to do that.
Oh, I'm on the wrong page. versions. There are actually there are a series of events that fire off when you do an update to a details view. All right. One of those, uh, the, the events are phrased in terms of present tense and past tense. All right. See, you wonder why you study English. All right, if you're going to be a programmer. Present tense are events that happen actually slightly before the activity happens. Past tense events are code that happens just after the event. So let's look up. Item updated equals, and I can give a name for that new event. And I'm going to say
but this is being more seamless before. I don't know, maybe maybe it's old age. I forget. You said it, not us. Yeah. So what did I do? I did two things. I went into the visual control and I said, I've created a method called details view player updated. That's the code that's going to happen after an update. All right? After an update. I then went in my code behind and I created the method for that. All right. This is a code that's going to run after there's an error. And I'm just going to put a stupid statement here. I'm just going to put a dumb statement just to have something that I can point my debugger at. And I'm going to say int x x equals 1 plus 1. All right. Now I'm going to point my debugger to stop at that in x equals 0. x equals 1 plus 1. Now I'm going to point my debugger at that code. So let me run this. And let me log in as done. So now I go and I try to change his user ID to MLZ, which is going to blow up. I click update. Bam! Debugger says I'm in that line of code. So I get a chance to do something with that error before the .NET framework kicks in and displays this ugly error message. If I click continue, it will go in, and boom, I get that. So we're running a little short on time. Next time, we'll look at the details of what we're going to do. I really just wanted to establish today that we have some hooks in here that we can put our code. Remember what a framework is. A framework is a starting point that you can build stuff on. So built within the ASP.NET framework, there is this item updated method that gets called after an update was attempted. All right. If we create code for that event then, we can handle any errors that occur before ASP.NET displays an ugly error message. All right. And the specifics of how we're going to do that we'll look at next time. All right. Questions about this so far? We are either now going to go and vote or go to land. All right. Or neither. Or neither. Have you ever seen the South Park episode about voting? Stan, Stan the whole time didn't want to vote because it was the difference between a turd sandwich and a douchebag. Literally. Yeah, can we get this?